Remembering the date when the Montreal Protocol was signed in 1987, India India become the part of that Montreal Protocol in 1992. The theme of the uh, this year, the World Ozone Day theme is uh, global cooperation protecting life on Earth. So on this occasion, we have with us Professor Ramachandran ji. He is a senior professor from Space and Atmospheric Sciences Division. CSIR Physical Research Laboratory, Ahmedabad, Gujarat. Now I request uh, Dr. Rajesh Grover. So before starting, uh, that uh, he uh, just uh, share his views on this equation. Thank you, Dr. Bhalla, and uh, very welcome to all our participants uh, who have joined us on this platform. And uh, esteemed Professor Ramachandran and uh, teachers from various schools and uh, my dear young friends. Uh, as you know that uh, every year we celebrate uh, International Day uh, uh, on 16 September uh, to create awareness about the protection of ozone layer and the substances that play an important role in the depletion of this uh, uh, very protective layer uh, and also to make the masses aware about the uh, threats that are being caused by these man-made chemicals as well as uh, uh, various uh, sorts of uh, uh, volatile organic compounds which are produced uh, in refrigeration and air conditioning industries. And uh, life on Earth, uh, in fact, would not have been uh, possible without uh, this protective uh, uh, stratospheric shield, I should say, uh, which protects us from the harmful ultraviolet uh, radiations. Uh, the, uh, this, uh, on this occasion, the creating of uh, this public awareness on all aspects of uh, including environmental protection, uh, in fact, assumes a very uh, significant place amongst the uh, core activity. And uh, uh, in fact, in 1987, uh, representatives from 24 countries, uh, they met in Canada, Montreal, and uh, agreed on the substances uh, that deplete the ozone layer. And uh, uh, they called for the they called for the world to get rid of these uh, substances that cause uh, ozone depletion. And uh, the United Nations General Assembly they uh, in fact uh, designated uh, uh, 16 September the day on which this uh, Montreal Protocol was signed as the International Day for uh, Ozone Depletion, uh, uh, which we are celebrating today. And uh, uh, on this occasion, I would like to ask the students to protect uh, and save this ozone layer by playing their role and by uh, planting more and more trees uh, using uh, renewable sources of energy and uh, eco-friendly substances. Uh, and also, I would urge especially our young friends to adopt public transport and do as much as cycling they can do to protect this ozone layer. And in fact, uh, uh, today we have with us Professor uh, Ramachandran from uh, uh, Space and Atmospheric Sciences Division, um, uh, Physical Research Laboratory, Ahmedabad. And uh, as he's our key speaker today, and he's going to talk about the important sources of ozone and causes of ozone depletion, as well as on the good ozone and bad ozone. So I welcome uh, him and all our participants who have joined us on this platform. And before um, uh, moving further, I would request uh, Dr. Balla to introduce Professor Ramachandran. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ramachandran, sir, is a senior professor at uh, Physical Research Laboratory, Ahmedabad. His area of research includes characterization of aerosols as well as modeling their impacts on radiation budget and climate. He is a lead author of the 2007 Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, which shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. He has published more than 100 research papers in peer-reviewed international journals. He is an associated editor in Frontiers in Environmental Sciences. He was a senior fellow at NASA Amis Research Center under the NASA postdoctoral program. He was a senior fellow at Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies at Germany in 2019. He is among the top 2% scientists in the world, as per the list published by the Stanford University. 
He recently authored a textbook entitled Atmospheric Aerosols, Cracticics, and Radi Radiative Effects, published by Taylor and Francis Group, USA. So uh, this is the brief profile of uh, Sir. So today, uh, the topic of his presentation is ozone and climate change. So I request uh, Professor Ramachandran, Sir, to please start his presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Grover uh, and Dr. Balla, for the invitation and also for the kind introduction. Um, are you able to see the slide? Are you able to see the slide? Anyone? No, sir. Okay, just a minute. Yeah, now it's with you. Now can you see? Yeah. Yes, sir. The title of the presentation is going to be Ozone and Climate Change, uh, where I will begin with an introduction, the sources and sinks of ozone, how they are distributed in terms of uh, space and time, and uh, how was it in the past? What is the present status and what does future hold for uh, the ozone as far as ozone is concerned? And then we'll summarize them. As was uh, mentioned by Dr. Grover in his introductory remarks, 16th September is the day on which the Montreal Protocol was signed, which was signed to curb the ozone depleting removal of or phase out of ozone depleting substances. And so, uh, this the theme of this year's Ozone Day is the global cooperation protecting life on Earth. So, 35 at 35, for example, it attains a special significance because in the human lifetime as well, mid 30s is a kind of uh, time for reflection to think about what we have achieved and look ahead as to what more we can accomplish. If in the case of Montreal Protocol as well, this is, this is no different. This is the most successful environmental treaty to date, uh, emphasizing the global cooperation. The, this, was, this is a story of notable achievements, which include discovery, understanding, decisions, those were taken, actions, and then verification. It is a story that was written by many scientists, technologists, economists, legal experts, and policy makers, in which continuous dialogue has been a key ingredient. Now, uh, while we will uh, get into the details, we will also come back to some of the uh, facts that if this substances were not removed from the atmosphere, how it would have affected the global warming, etc. So let us uh, begin the presentation. Before we understand about ozone and then uh, discuss about where they are, what they are, etc., it is first important to understand how the temperature structure the Earth's atmosphere varies as a function of altitude and why there are different spheres, why there are different regions and how they vary, how the temperature varies as a function of the altitude. The, as uh, all of you are aware, the air that we breathe is essentially a nitrogen oxygen uh, air from the atmosphere. Both these gases occupy 99% the remaining 1% is the 1% is the where all these other trace gases, including ozone, carbon dioxide, argon, etc., compete with each other in addition to what we call as the pollutants, very small particles that are present in the atmosphere. And uh, most of you are aware that as you go up in the atmosphere, the temperature decreases and the region where we live. Uh, is uh, known as the troposphere, 
and it is bounded by a boundary that we call as the tropopause. Above tropopause is a stratosphere, then stratopause, mesosphere, mesopause, etc. In this view graph, not only the temperature structure, but also the some of the natural, naturally occurring phenomena, including Mount Everest, the clouds, etc. Uh, you can see this on the right hand side, along with the techniques or the platforms that we use to study the atmosphere, including ozone. The, in addition to understanding how the temperature varies, it is equally important to know what we mean by weather and climate. The Earth's climate is a complex interactive system and it is determined by a number of physical, chemical and biological processes that happen in the atmosphere, on the land surface, on snow and ice, as well as in oceans. In addition to these spheres that we are seeing here, namely cryosphere, biosphere, atmosphere, etc., we are also seeing several known phenomena or facts, including the composition of the atmosphere, we see a volcano, we see clouds, etc. The energy that we receive from the sun is the main driver of the earth atmosphere system. The composition of the air that we breathe, we have already seen, that is consisting of nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, water vapor, sulfur dioxide, etc. Climate, when we say it is the long term, 30 years average of weather. And a change in climate is can be is the one that can be determined by the changes in B and the, or the variability of any of its properties or the parameters that you see in this graph, starting from the radiation that we receive from the sun, the influence humans we have, the changes in the glacial melting changes in the hydrological cycle, the changes in clouds, changes in the ocean, etc. So it is a complex and a connected interactive system. Next uh, aspect that we would like to brief upon, briefly look upon is the, what we know as the earth atmosphere radiation budget. As I mentioned earlier that the radiation that is coming from the sun is the main driver of the earth atmosphere system. We receive about 340 watt per meter square from the sun in the short wave region. And then 342 watt per meter square goes back into the atmosphere and beyond the atmosphere. When the radiation is received, it, is, it interacts with the uh, characteristics of the properties that make up the atmosphere, including clouds, gases, etc. And uh, when the radiation falls upon the Earth's surface, there are also other physical processes that take place and the Earth emits the radiation back, which is in the long wave region. That is wavelengths that are greater than four micrometer. And if you look at the numbers that are there in the top row, 342 came in, 107 first goes up, and then 235 goes up. So that equals to 342 watt per minute. So what is what we are getting in is the amount that goes back up into the atmosphere. Now you are wondering as to why we are worried about what we call as the global warming. Now let us look at the numbers and keeping into account the processes that happen at the surface, in the atmosphere, and also at the top of the atmosphere. We saw this balance, and if you look at the values in the surface, also this will be balanced. In the atmosphere as well, it is balanced. So if you look at the net transfer of radiative energy to the surface, the processes, those were there, like absorbed by the surface, surface radiation, and the radiation that gets emitted, etc. We put in these numbers, we get uh, forcing about 100 watt per meter square. And what is the surface giving back to the atmosphere? You put in the process in what, put in the values in watt per meter square, you get a negative of this number. So, 
at the top of the atmosphere, in the atmosphere, at the surface, and within the surface as well as in the atmosphere, the radiation that is coming in is well balanced. There is nothing like we are missing from it. And uh, I also kept mentioning the radiation and its budget in terms of what per meter square, because it is the energy that we are receiving is given in watts and it is per unit area. So that is expressed in terms of meter square per meter square. So we are talking about so many watts per meter square. However, we know that what is coming in is not going back exactly, and that is the cause of worry and that we call as the global warming. The natural greenhouse effect, which is uh, the natural effect that occurs in the atmosphere before, prior to the global warming, is the warming of the Earth's atmosphere due to the presence of background greenhouse gases primarily, water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, ozone, nitrous oxide, and methyl gold. Because of this natural greenhouse effect, the Earth's surface temperature is about 15 degrees centigrade. This is the global annual mean value. Otherwise, the temperature of the Earth would be about minus 18 degrees centigrade, which I'm sure you will appreciate that is too cold to support life. Now, global warming is the increase in the Earth's temperature above the natural greenhouse effect temperature that we just discussed as a result of increase in the emissions of emissions from the human made human activities in terms of greenhouse gases, ozone, and aerosols, which are the pollutants, what we call as the pollutants in the common formats. As was mentioned earlier uh, during the introduction, that there is a there is a body uh, that assesses the state of the climate of the Earth's um, in regular intervals, and that is uh, known as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. When the last uh, IPCC report in brief was being prepared, the authors were asked uh, to list the, the three most influential climate change research papers that were ever published there so far. And uh, the papers by Suki Manabe, Hasselman and uh, Giorgio Parisi were the top three which, which were listed. And uh, as most of you are aware, in the year 2021, the Nobel Prize in Physics went to these three physical scientists for their, which they de in which they demonstrated that the, the impact of carbon dioxide and water vapor on global warming. And uh, the, and also quantifying the variability uh, and predicting the global warming. And uh, for Giorgio Parisi, for the discovery of the interplay, as you know, the butterfly effect that we are aware of, the, or what we call as the chaos. It is the interplay of disorder and the fluctuations that happen in physical systems, meaning changes that occur in one particular location or in region will have an impact on the other regions the Earth. Coming back to the subject matter of today's discussion, namely ozone. Ozone is primarily found in two regions of the atmosphere, 10% in the troposphere where we live and 90% in the stratosphere. The vertical profile of ozone is given as a function of the altitude gain. We can see a large amount of ozone is present about 15 kilometers and going all the way up to 30 kilometers. Comparatively, the abundance of ozone in the atmosphere is low. In the stratosphere, where there is 90% of the ozone that is present, we will, we will encounter only 10,000 ozone molecules for every 1 billion air molecules. That is 1 into 10 to the power of 9. While in the troposphere, it is much, much less. It could be varying anywhere between 20 to 100. If uh, we are given an opportunity to condense all the ozone that is present in the 
Earth's atmosphere, starting from the troposphere all the way up to the top, then it will only be about three millimeter thick. That is two one rupee coins put together. That is all the thickness of the ozone that we are talking about. And uh, as is the practice in any scientific field, the effect or the instrument or the unit that is uh, first discovered or used to measure is goes after a scientist who discovered that. In this case, we saw earlier that the ozone concentration the, or the abundance of ozone is very less in the atmosphere and uh, that is illustrated here when we count the number of air molecules present in the Earth's atmosphere, it is on the order of about 10 to the power of 25 molecules per centimeter square. But the same, if you look at the number of ozone, then it is about 10 to the power of 18. So, the amount of ozone or the number of ozone is about seven times lower, seven orders lower than what we breathe, the air molecules. Despite its very low abundance, we know that ozone is very important as it absorbs the biologically harmful ultraviolet radiation that comes from the sun. Because of this beneficial role, the ozone that is found in the stratosphere, where 90% of the ozone is found percent, is known as the good ozone. Ozone is also produced in the Earth's surface or near the in the troposphere where we live because of the vehicular emissions uh, coming from uh, emissions from industries, organic compounds, etc., from the fossil fuel and biomass burning. Because this is harmful. Uh, to the human health, air quality, and plants, etc. This ozone that is produced near where we live is known as the bad ozone. So the, the point is, more ozone far from us is good, but ozone near us is bad. We know that the human exposure to the ultraviolet biologically harmful radiation increases the risk of skin cancer, cataracts, it suppresses the immune system, it damages the terrestrial plant life, organisms, and aquatic ecosystems. Ozone is connected to climate. It is important as it is a greenhouse gas in the troposphere and in the stratosphere. It absorbs the infrared radiation emitted from the Earth's surface and it traps heat in the atmosphere and the heating temperature increase in the stratosphere is due to the ozone that is present in the stratosphere. While a decrease in the ozone in the stratosphere will lead to a cooling, conversely, an increase in the tropospheric ozone will lead to surface warming, thereby contributing to global warming. Ozone is a key ingredient that initiates chemical cleansing of the atmosphere of various pollutants, which include carbon monoxide, nitrous oxides, and methane. When they accumulate to harmful levels and thereby ozone exerts a stronger influence on climate. Therefore, the point is any increase or decrease, any change in the amount of tropospheric or stratospheric ozone can produce a climate impact and thereby the link between ozone and climate is established. Ozone is mainly produced in the tropical upper stratosphere through oxygen photochemistry. When the oxygen molecule, when the radiation that comes from the sun lower than 240 nanometer wavelength, uh, it interacts with the oxygen molecule. It breaks into two oxygen atoms, which then recombines to form the ozone molecule. And then it gets destroyed in a similar fashion when wavelengths less than 1100 nanometer get involved. Typically, um, this is uh, this the earlier figure that we saw is that 90% of the ozone is found in the stratosphere, while 10% is found in the lower altitudes. This is true across the globe in different uh, latitudinal regimes as is shown here. 
for the formation of ozone, we need uh, both the oxygen molecules as well as the radiation, as we saw uh, in the previous transfers. We know that the oxygen uh, decreases exponentially as a function of the altitude, and the amount of solar radiation that we receive from the sun, it actually uh, goes down as is shown in this figure, like a half portion of the letter U. The ozone will follow the profile where these two curves get multiplied, and uh, that is why the maximum ozone that is we see in the stratosphere is because of this interaction that takes place between the oxygen molecules that are available and the radiation that occurs. The ozone concentration is low at lower altitudes, and uh, we know that it peaks in the stratosphere, and also at the higher altitudes, it is lower. At lower altitudes, why the value is lower? Because atomic oxygen is low, where solar radiation that dissociates atomic oxygen does not penetrate. At higher altitudes, the reaction that we just now saw, O2 plus HNO becoming two O's and O2 plus O, that is the reaction is slow, and we know that the density of O2 is lower at the higher altitudes. The, the ozone that is produced in the tropical upper stratosphere gets transported across to the other latitude near regions where uh, this the ozone rich air goes up into the atmosphere to other regions and then it sinks into the stratospheric altitudes in the uh, both the high latitude regions. The ozone that is present in the atmosphere exhibits a strong latitude, longitude, and seasonal variations. They also exhibit interannual variations. These variations occur because of the differences in the air motions mixing of ozone rich air between high and low ozone, changes in the balance of chemical production and loss of ozone as air gets transported. So the balance uh, between production and loss is sensitive to the amount of sunlight that is found in each region and also uh, as a function of the how the transport takes this ozone to higher uh, regions, etc. Typically, the the values are higher during spring and then values are lower during the autumn right, or fall. Um, as I mentioned, they will uh, have, they will exhibit, the ozone exhibits intraannual variation. So we can see this is for the year 2003 and we can see there is a difference between uh, the ozone concentrations across the globe in the year 2013. The values that are in uh, yellow, red, and magenta indicate that are high values of ozone. The values that are in blue, green, etc. indicate they are lower. Coming back to the ozone depletion that we all are familiar with, uh, where the ozone is lost or de decreases in the high northern and southern latitudes. This occurs because of the, the halogen source gases that are emitted at the surface by the human activities and also by the natural process. These halogen source gases accumulate in the atmosphere and they get distributed throughout the lower atmosphere by winds and other motions. Then they get transported to the stratosphere. These halogen source gases, they get converted into reactive halogen gases in the stratosphere due to chemical reactions that involve the ultraviolet radiation from the sun. These reactive halogen gases then interact with ozone, then deplete, lead to a decrease in the ozone. In the higher southern and northern latitudes, there is another interesting phenomena that occurs, uh, which we call as the polar stratospheric clouds, which is entirely different than what we see outside for windows here in the tropics, uh, which causes more severe ozone depletion. Then how these gases get removed, the air containing reactive halogen gases then returns uh, to the troposphere where they are removed from the air moisture by clouds and rain. You look at the, among the chlorofluorocarbons, namely the chlorine and the bromine, there are also natural sources in both the cases but there is a significant amount of human activity and the source and the gases that come out of it. 
So the variation in the natural sources has not been very uh, different for the past 50, 60 years, but there has been a huge increase in the amount of gases that come from the anthropogenic activities. The total chlorine in the stratosphere is about 150 times more than the chromium gas. The human activity sources, the emissions from the human activities are the largest for both these uh, chlorine and bromine containing gases. As was seen earlier, the, the halogen source gases which include the carbon, chlorofluorocarbon 12, 13, etc., 113, all these, they get converted into reactive halogen gases which include chlorine monoxide, bromine monoxide, bromine atoms, chlorine atoms, etc., through the reactions that involve ultraviolet radiation. And in the reaction that occurs where ozone and the chlorine molecule is involved, is connected, the chlorine atom survives as a catalyst and then it, it, it destroys ozone in a catalytic reaction. Typically, uh, the catalytic chlorine atom can destroy about tens of thousands of ozone molecules before it loses energy and comes down and then goes back up. I mentioned about the polar stratospheric clouds. These are nothing but um, the nitric acid and the water that are present already there, and they condense on the pre-existing sulfur-containing particles, which are nothing but the aerosols, solid or liquid particles that are suspended in the medium of Why polar stratospheric clouds occur only in the higher uh, latitudes? That is because the temperatures are low, very low, so it's about minus 78 degrees centigrade in the polar stratosphere. This is the uh, photo of the polar stratospheric cloud in the northern high latitude uh, near Sweden. And if you look at the temperatures in the polar stratosphere, we see that this is for the Antarctic region. The straight line in black is the minus 78 degrees centigrade line. And this is as a function of uh, month from May to October, we see that for more than six months in a year, over the Antarctic stratosphere, the temperatures are lower than minus 78 degrees centigrade. The immediate question is that does this occur only in the southern hemisphere? In the northern hemisphere, in the Arctic as well, the temperatures are lower than minus 78. However, the duration um, in which the temperatures are lower than minus 78 is only two months as compared to the six months in the Antarctic uh, region. I see um, a few hands. Is it like questions? Then please can unmute yourself and ask the question. Yes, go ahead. Please unmute and then Dr. Balla, are we going to take questions now or we'll, we'll wait till the end? Sir, you please continue. We will take oh. later on. Okay. okay. The, the depletion that occurs in the Antarctic, for example, why it should occur only in Antarctic uh, in late winter, early spring? That is because the that region is now uh, rich with the reactive halogen gases. And we know in the high northern latitudes, there is six months of sunlight and six months of darkness. And the air that is there present over the high latitudes is isolated from the other air or the other air mixture. And so that we call as the vortex. Uh, a photo of vortex is given here. The, the surrounding the air that is contained in this column is now doesn't interact with the air that is surrounding this. And uh, now when the sunlight comes and ozone gets formed, as we know, as we have seen the reaction, then the, the reactive halogen gases then start attracting with the ozone and then they'll start depleting. Much like tiger waiting for a prey, as soon as the prey comes, just goes and then starts biting. We also saw that 
in order for these uh, the depletion of ozone to occur we need certain conditions in addition to the uh, the polar vortex etc and the polar stratosphere clouds you look at the values in may and then compare it with in september when the ozone hole or depletion is at its peak we can see the conditions for example ozone in may before the ozone hole occurs every year we see values are high forget about the numbers red yellow indicates higher values blue green purple indicates lower values the hydrogen chloride is uh, high but the temperatures are very are lower in may when ozone is also high but when in september you can see the temperatures have fallen down less than minus 70 degrees centigrade over the entire region we see that the ozone has now depleted to about the lowest about 100 watt tops and units of and this has occurred in the last 50 years time frame so this is starting from 1970 when it was uh, very the values were very high and now in 2030 you can see the red the green has now turned to blue where the ozone concentration is about 100 tops and units so that is because of the reactions that we saw which deplete ozone consistently every year now the current year if you look at it this is the white um, map that you see is the antarctic region and we see that the values are about 300 or so in june of this year but in september you can see the values have now fallen by about 100 tops and units or so and uh, the region where the values are lower than 100 is not only over antarctic but the regions that are beyond the antarctic continent and uh, we can also see uh, the evolution of this in terms of the the area where the values are lower than 220 tops and unit and uh, the temperatures the minimum ozone values that we have seen in uh, this region and uh, how the uh, stratospheric temperature has changed the uh, maximum area where the ozone values are lower than 220 tops and unit has now reached 25 million square kilometer which is nearly twice the size of the antarctic continent it is almost equivalent to the size of the north american continent and uh, when the ozone values fall lower than 220 tops and unit that we call as the ozone hole and uh, why that from where this number came 220 tops and unit because any value lower than 220 tops and unit were never found in the historical observations over antarctic prior to the year 1979 we looked at uh, the depletion over antarctic and we also saw that the ozone values can be lower both in the southern antarctic as well as in the northern uh, high latitudes namely arctic and now the difference as a function of the altitude between antarctic and arctic is plotted here we can see that in the antarctic there is a significant reduction that are, that has happened in terms of the ozone uh, when the ozone peak occurs somewhere in september october wherein we can see a depletion of a decrease of 90% of the ozone that should be present as now gone and this occurs every year this has been occurring for the last 40 years or so before that we see this was the value that we got and the total concentration was roughly about 300 tops in unit now it is about 150 or so in uh, certain years the values have even become lower in the last 50 years the lowest is found in 2006 when we can see between the altitudes of 14 and 20 km over the antarctic there is in fact no ozone that is present at all the values are all zero in the arctic we see depletion a decrease but it is not as high as you see in the antarctic why because typically the amount of ozone that is present in the arctic region is higher than the amount of ozone that is present in the antarctic when we looked at the the journey of ozone that is produced in the tropics and it goes to the higher latitudes the amount of air that with rich with ozone 
dump is actually more in the northern hemisphere when compared to the southern hemisphere. So that gives rise to higher ozone values in the northern hemisphere and compared to the southern hemisphere. Now we looked, we mentioned that we saw that there are uh, this polluted particles play a role in, in this ozone uh, chain or ozone depletion. These, as I mentioned earlier, these are solid or liquid particles that are suspended in air that are produced by both natural or human activities. One of the natural sources of this is a volcanic eruption, which injects a large amount of sulfur dioxide gas molecules to the atmosphere. Now, how small are they is, uh, is illustrated here. We see uh, this is the all famous now the coronavirus, which is about 0.1 to 0.5 micrometer. And we are seeing the dust particle here that is about 2.5 micrometer. Bigger size dust particles are seen. This is the grain of pollen that you get from the, uh, the plant plants. And then um, the look at the beach sand, for example, it's about 90 micrometer. And uh, compare this with the human hair, it's roughly about 50 to 180 micrometer. And compared to this, you can see the scale the particles are the relative size. These are about 50 to 100 times smaller than these polluted particles. The sulfur dioxide that is injected from a volcano gets converted into sulfate aerosol in the stratospheric altitudes and then this provides the surface or the, the uh, platform for this ozone depletion reaction stalker. We had seen before that chlorine um, depletes the ozone values when the hydrochloric hydrogen chloride combines with chlorine nitrate, this reaction takes place on the surface of this particle. The number increases after a volcanic eruption. The size of the particles also increases after the volcanic eruption, leading to uh, a larger depletion of ozone. As is shown here, when uh, there is a large increase in the amount of aerosols following a volcanic eruption, these are the results after the Mount Pinotobo volcanic eruption, which occurred on June 15, 1991. We see that where there is an increase in the altitudes, where there is an increase in the aerosol amount, which otherwise would have been zero along this dotted line, because uh, there is no other source of uh, aerosols in the stratospheric altitudes, except for a small amount of sulfate particles that are produced in the troposphere gets transported across. There are only a few number of particles. But after a volcanic eruption, there can be hundreds of these particles. We can see that where there is an increase of these aerosol concentration or the pollutant concentration, we can see that there is a corresponding depletion or a decrease in the ozone values, thereby establishing the link that the, the gases that are present in the stratospheric altitudes in the higher northern and the southern hemisphere, they under, under, undergo a reaction on the surface of either a solid or liquid and leads to ozone depletion. Because the, the phase in which this reaction takes place are of different kinds, these are heterogeneous. Gas interacting with gas on a solid or liquid, and that is why this the mechanism is a heterogeneous chemical now, the, <clears throat> the two natural sources that could have contributed to the variation, the ozone that we see, is we know that the amount of solar radiation is the one that is important for the formation of ozone, whether the changes in the amount of radiation that we received in the last 300, 400 years have led to the changes in the ozone. And the other one is the volcanic eruption. Just now, as we saw, after a volcanic eruption, when a large amount of large number of sulfate particles are introduced in the atmosphere, then that will also result in the ozone depletion. So, first let us look at the radiation that we receive on the Earth's surface. 
This is the total solar radiation given again in watt per meter squared in the last 60 years or so. You see a cyclic 11 year old cycle that I'm sure you are all aware that it is the solar cycle of 11 years with the maximum and a minimum and a maximum and minimum which goes on, changes in every uh, 11 years. But if you look at the decrease in the ozone, it's a very consistent decrease that is plotted in, the, in this figure. There is a constant decrease. I mean, this cyclic variation, you don't see this here happening over the ozone decrease. Now, let us, let us come to the next uh, natural cause of the, the variation in ozone, which is the volcanic eruption. In the last 60 years, there has been about uh, five to six major volcanic eruptions. And as you can see, the impact of the increase in the pollutant particles in the stratosphere, it is a kind of a transient phenomenon. It lasts for about one or two years, and then it comes back up. So this decrease, you can associate with every volcanic eruption that has occurred on the Earth's atmosphere. Now, you combine these two, we still don't see the pattern that ozone is getting. However, we see that the values of ozone depletion have increased after a major volcanic eruption such as Mount Pinatubo. You can see the ozone depletion that has been seen is the lowest in the years 92 and 93 because of the heterogeneous chemical reaction that we just now saw. The consistent decrease in the ozone in the last 50 years, therefore, occurred because of the amount of chlorine and the bromine, namely the chlorofluorocarbons, those are present. So, if you look at the natural sources as a function of time, we saw that there are both natural and the human uh, sources. Human activities contribute to the ozone depleting substances. We see that the natural sources have been very uniform in the last 50 years. However, the, the gas the emissions from the human activities have increased and then the ozone has depleted. You can see an, 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 a mirror image of the increase in the amount of chlorine and bromine and the corresponding decrease in the depletion of the ozone values, thereby establishing the fact that the two natural sources, namely variation in the solar radiation and volcanic eruption, are not the causes for the long-term decrease in global total ozone. The only reason for the decrease of the depletion in ozone is the amount of the abundance, stratospheric abundances of chlorine and bromine that have come from the chlorine, etc. Now, uh, one of the uh, main factors of uh, signing the treaty of uh, the Montreal Protocol in 1987 was to phase out these gases that are contributing to the uh, ozone depletion. For example, this phase out and the corresponding decreases that we are seeing as a function of the year starting from 1950, when the gases in the these gases that deplete ozone peaked at around uh, 1980s and then some of the gases peaked a little later because of their longer residence times of varying anywhere from 45 to 100 years. This, uh, this action of phasing out these or the, and the corresponding decreases has protected millions of people from skin cancer and cataracts over the years since the signing of the quantum it has, uh, this phasing out has allowed the vital ecosystems to survive and thrive. It safeguarded life on Earth and it also slowed climate change. If ozone depleting substances, any of these or all of this, had not been banned or phased out, then we would have been looking at a global temperature rise of an additional 2.5 degrees centigrade. As you know, today the earth has warmed by about 1.2 degrees centigrade when compared to the last 300 years. 
that is attributed entirely due to the increases in the anthropogenic emissions and not due to natural causes such as carbon dioxide, increases in carbon dioxide, aerosols, methane, nitrous oxide, etc. Now, if these substances, the ozone depleting substances were not banned and phased out, this would have been about 4 degrees, the warming would have been 4 degrees. This, I am sure, I don't need to say this, would have been a catastrophe. Now, We looked at earlier uh, some of the figures wherein the ozone values have uh, shown, were shown, and we looked at when the peak depletion occurs, the values come down to about 100 thousand units or so. The ozone, similar to the ozone values that we saw, which exhibits interannual variability, the ozone hole or the depletion that occurs also exhibits interannual variability. In on 24 September 2001. Versus 24 September 2003, we can see the ozone holes look more or less similar. And in the background, the black map that you see is the Antarctic continent. Now, what happened in the year 2002 is as follows: the ozone hole was not the area was not that, that as big as this one. The two years before and after, as well as the ozone hole or the depletion area split into two of them. It was initially circular, but it split into two regions. That is, that was caused by the uh, meteorological disturbances of the conditions where the, the polar stratosphere warmed. And we know that for the polar stratospheric clouds to form and then the ozone values to deplete because of the heterogeneous chemical reaction, we need temperatures that are lower than minus 78 degrees centigrade. Because of the warming, the temperatures were not that as either lower or lower than minus 78 degrees centigrade. Therefore, when the temperatures were warmer, the depletion was less. That happened in the year 2002. And that we call this phenomenon is called as the sudden stratospheric warming that occurs more or less during the same time frame as the ozone depletion time. We talked about the stratospheric ozone and its importance in the troposphere where we are living. We also saw that ozone is produced, and this occurs because of the emissions from the industrial facilities and electric utilities, motor vehicles, petrol, and chemical solvents that are some of the major sources of oxides of nitrogen and the volatile organic compounds. These get kind of baked in the sunlight that we are receiving. And then they produce ozone. Now, this ozone is which is coming from the harmful emissions of vehicle and industries, etc., which results in a, a smoggy or a, or a foggy condition. Smoke combined with fog is harmful for human health as well as for the air quality and plant life, etc. When we look at the contribution of the changes in the ozone that can contribute to climate. The, the depletion of ozone, decrease in ozone in the stratosphere produces a cooling, but an increase in the ozone in the tropospheric altitudes, the surface will contribute to global warming. Therefore, uh, when we look at when the stratosphere will come back to its natural levels of ozone, those were present in the previous 50 years or so, beginning from 1980. We look at the values, then this is the 1980 value, and then we now are here when the ozone values have depleted and we are on the way to recovery, but they haven't reached yet as the values of 1980. They will, the ozone values will be back up to the values those we, those we saw about 78 years ago, which this will occur in about 30 years from now, roughly around 2050. The same holds good for the Antarctic zone as well. Now, this will happen provided there are two major things that do not happen, which are natural again. One is no volcanic eruption and other meteorological variations that occurred that we saw 
if that happened in 2002, as well as as recently in the year 2019. Because of the sudden stratospheric warming, the ozone levels got disturbed and the depletion changed. Now, after a volcanic eruption, here is the example. The ozone was, it was coming back up to a situation, but then the, because of the increase in the amount of the sulfate particles from a volcanic eruption and the associated heterogeneous chemical reactions that occur on these particles, the ozone depletion values across the globe were much, much lower than the normal level. And so this also will delay the, the, the growth curve. If these two phenomena occur, then this could delay maybe about five years or so. Instead of 2050, it will become the ozone values will be back up in the year 2055. As far as the tropospheric ozone, which occurs due to the increase in the urban pollution, it is actually showing an increase in trend. That is because of the increase in the anthropogenic emissions. So, as I mentioned earlier, a reduction in the tropospheric ozone will improve air quality. Not only that, because this ozone contributes to global warming, a reduction of this will lead to global cooling. So in summary, we began with what is ozone, its importance, the sources and sinks, how they are, how the ozone is related to climate, and how as a function of altitude, space, time, and as a function of the year, how the distribution changes, what are the uh, features that, that lead to ozone depletion, we focused on the Antarctic region, where which are the causative mechanisms, the features that are associated with that. And then how the aerosol the pollutants that are produced by natural causes contribute to this ozone depletion and how ozone impacts the climate and uh, what does future hold for us in terms of the ozone recovery we saw. With this, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, participants, if anybody want to ask any question, please. Yes, go ahead. Unmute yourself and then. Please unmute. Manpreet, please unmute. We kindly uh, unmute him. Yeah, now, now, now unmute him. Unmute and then ask. Yes, go ahead. This side, sir, Manpre Singh from SPPS Convent School. Sir, my question is how we can rebuild the ozone layer? How we can rebuild the ozone layer? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, ozone can be produced in the laboratory. Uh, we know that. I mean, oxygen molecule and oxygen atoms are uh, enough to form the uh, ozone. But the question is, how do you fill, fill this up in the stratosphere where the ozone is uh, low, where it is depleted? The amount of ozone, uh, total amount that is present in the atmosphere, and then uh, we weigh it in terms of what is there, it's roughly about 3,000 megatons. 3,000 into 10 to the power of uh, 12 grams. The depletion, the amount of ozone that is depleted is an, on an average is about 3%. That translates to 90 megatons of ozone in the stratospheric altitudes. Now, uh, as you may be very well aware, the when we fly on the international corridor, uh, the altitude that we reach, touch upon is about 15 kilometers or so. In order for the ozone uh, to put, we have to go above that. And uh, the amount of uh, energy that is required to produce this much amount of ozone and to fill at regular intervals is roughly one third of the energy that is required to run the United States of America on an annual basis, which is in terms of the trillion kilowatt hours. Now, Apart from uh, this, look at the logistics that is involved. Not only ozone, when it is stored in large amounts, it is actually explosive. That is, that is one aspect. 
but even if we say that okay we will we'll still be able to do this now it's only the question of transport then you will have to transport it in jets for which you will be using a lot of fossil fuel and uh, by burning so much fossil fuel you will be actually contributing to global warming which i don't need to say at all so um though it may sound very easy to go and fill it up but looking at the amount of ozone that is lost and the way to fill it up it is it has a lot of implications both in terms of policy logistics and economics any more questions yes no questions sir so uh, now we are winding up the program there is a question from jaspreet yes unmute yourself yeah sir yes. my question is can we measure the ozone layer can we can we measure the ozone layer can we measure yes 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 um so this is the these are the measurements on this uh so we are winding up the program measurements so First, you can see that the ozone has depleted has decreased just wait pala ji we are thank, thankful to professor ramachandran no just oh, wait he is asking a question there is a question yes yes sir you were telling something about measurement of ozone layer no i have already i have already explained that uh, how she asked how do we can we measure the ozone layer the answer is yes so that's how that's what i showed as a profile So is there any other question? I think there is no more question. So we are winding up the program. First of all, I am thankful to Professor Ramachandran. Uh, sir for accepting our invitation uh, to be with us to grace this occasion and for such a informative talk i am thankful to director general director uh, science city for their valuable support and guidance i'm thankful to all the participants for their active participation i'm thankful to the media for the coverage of the event i'm thankful to my staff member for to make this event successful thank you all thank you thank you sir Thank you, sir. I look forward to, uh, for your visit to Science City. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.